may be seated. Amen. Why don't we pray together and offer thanks to the Lord Jesus. Father, in the midst of all of the sorrows and griefs of this life, we rejoice tonight together in the fact that the tomb is empty and the throne is occupied. And because of that, none of our labor is in vain. And so I pray you would encourage my brothers tonight to be faithful to the end. We may finish our race until we see our Christ, who is worthy of all of our praise. Empower us. Encourage our souls tonight to be faithful to the task you've called us to. We pray this in Christ's good name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible tonight, I invite you to open with me to Colossians chapter 1. We'll begin reading in just a moment in uh, verse 24. I'd like to uh, build on what has already been said uh, today from Dr. Woodhouse and Pastor Begg. It's been a most encouraging few days for me. I don't know about you. Uh, trust that it has. Just uh, hearing the messages, uh, meeting new friends, uh, seeing old friends. This has truly been a highlight of, of my year and uh, a, a tremendous honor to, uh, to be here at this conference. Uh, my title for the uh, sermon tonight is taken from Philip's paraphrase of verse 28, where he paraphrases it as, so naturally we proclaim Christ. So naturally we proclaim Christ. Lord willing, I will be at the site of ancient Colossae next Thursday. I've been there well, on one occasion, but there's nothing to see. Uh, it's an unexcavated mound that simply has a road sign that says Colossae. And it's uh, kind of my secret fantasy to excavate it uh, one day. There are only 31 artifacts, according to one dissertation, that have ever been discovered from Colossae. Um, but the Lord has preserved for us the letter to the Colossians which is a lot more important than anything I could probably dig up uh, on that mound. Uh, as you know, the people of Colossae needed to know the real Christ. They were spiritually confused. And we can all relate to those kinds of contexts. And so Paul pens some of the most glorious words in Scripture about the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ and consequently the need to proclaim Christ in this little letter. And so I'd like to read beginning in verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And this is God's word. Michael Horton, in his book, Christless Christianity, poses the question, what would happen if Satan took over a city? And over a half century ago, he quotes Donald Gray Barnhouse, who offered his own scenario, speculating that if Satan took over Philadelphia, the following things uh, would take place. He says, interestingly, that all the bars would be closed. Pristine streets would be filled with tidy pedestrians who smiled at each other. There would be no swearing. The children would say, yes, sir, and no, ma'am. And the churches would be full every Sunday but Christ would not be preached. Now, you may not agree with that whole scenario. There's clearly some exaggeration in that, but you know the point that Barnhouse was trying to make. Satan is not troubled by some kind of moral improvement plan or people getting a bit nicer or being a bit more religious. What Satan does not want is Christ being preached. And pro Paul's primary subject of his preaching ministry is quite clear, isn't it, in verse 28? It's a person, him we proclaim. We don't proclaim a formula or a moral religious system per se, but the Savior. And I love that's uh, Philip's paraphrase of that. So naturally we proclaim Christ. And he says it that way because he's, he's linking up what was said uh, before that. And you're all familiar with this glorious passage in Colossians chapter one, beginning in verse 15. 
Paul speaks of Christ's clarity, that he is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. And he speaks of Christ's creation, for by him all things were created, and so on. Then he speaks of Christ's control, that he's sustaining all things. Then he speaks of Christ's church, he's the head of the body. And then he speaks in verse 21 and following of Christ's cross. And you see the repetition, and he, and he, and he. I don't know if you've ever met a, a person before you just throw out a topic that they're interested in and you can't shut them up. You know, you, you look at your Uncle Jim or whatever and you say, hey, you really loved your old Jeep, didn't you? And off he goes, talking about his, his Jeep. Or uh, you, you, you look to a person who loves LeBron and you say, MJ was way better than LeBron. And, and uh, it's a great debate. Or you, you say, Kansas City barbecue is the best barbecue uh, that there is. And, and I hear some amens, yeah. Uh, when I was in seminary, we had a professor that loved to talk about Qumran. And whenever we didn't have our Hebrew homework, I would always raise my question and say, hey, Dr. Cole, didn't they find Psalm 42 in cave 11? And off he would go on cave 11, you know, just uh, waxing eloquently about all the things that were there. It's kind of that way here in, in Colossians. As Paul talks about Christ's redemption in verse 12, or in, uh, verse 13 rather, in 14, and then he gets into this great Christ hymn, and he really doesn't stop until the end of the letter. And the whole letter, he's, he's talking about the supremacy of Christ. And because he is supreme, he is consequently sufficient. And so he's preaching to these Colossians, you don't need Jesus plus something else, that Jesus himself is sufficient. So naturally we proclaim him. It should be quite obvious that we are proclaiming Christ. But I know you guys are aware that everything but Christ is being preached in many places uh, around the world. But sometimes even godly men who love Jesus, they also need to kind of sharpen their focus a bit. Most assume that they are doing Christ-centered preaching. Uh, Pastor Begg mentioned this earlier today, but uh, the Lloyd-Jones uh, story, I, I think this is in the first 40 years, uh, that volume, uh, when the minister came up to Lloyd-Jones and he says, I can't figure out whether you're a Quaker or a hyper-Calvinist, uh, because you, you talk about uh, the sovereignty of God in one, in one way, and then you talk about life in the Spirit in another way, but then he said, but the, the cross and the work of Christ have, a little, have little place in your preaching. And that's when, as we were told uh, this, this morning, that he went and locked himself up and began to read all of these books about the atonement. And this is what Lloyd-Jones said. I was like Whitfield in my early preaching. First I preached regeneration, that all man's efforts in morality and education are useless, and that we need power from outside ourselves. I assumed the atonement, but did not distinctly preach it, or justification by faith. This man set me thinking, and I began to read more fully in theology. You see, the good news tonight is that you can change the way you preach. You're still alive, <laughs> right? And good men who love Jesus, who love the Bible, often need to sharpen their focus. Uh, one of, one of uh, my friends uh, told the story of being in a preaching class taught by Ed Clowney, who's a uh, wonderful uh, Christ-centered preaching instructor, and he was talking about preaching Christ from the Old Testament, and my friend was not having it. And so day by day in this seminar, he began to get in arguments with uh, Dr. Clowney that you cannot preach Christ where he is not mentioned. And he kept saying, oh, yes, you can. And he would get more heated day by day, and eventually he was won over by the end of the week, and he was upset because he said he had just preached Nehemiah, and he had only mentioned Jesus' name at the closing prayer. So having now been convinced that this is how he should treat the Old Testament, like we've been taught uh, by Dr. Woodhouse this week, he goes back to his congregation and decides to preach Nehemiah all over again, uh, <laughs> determining that he would find a way to uh, preach the gospel, to find Spurgeon's road uh, to, uh, to Calvary. And I love that story um, because we should always remain that, you know, that, have that teachable spirit. Well, I want to encourage you tonight to make the hero of the Bible the hero of every sermon you preach. The hero of the Bible to be the hero of every sermon you preach. This is just one of many texts in the New Testament that emphasize the centrality of Christ in the Scriptures. You, you know, you, you open up, you don't go very long at all, 
in, in John's gospel, and you see all of this stuff. And at one of the places in John 145, Philip goes to find Nathanael, and he says, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And you're kind of like, well, Philip, maybe you're just a little bit too excited. This is the one who fulfilled all of this, but then you turn over to John 5, 39, and it was Jesus himself who said, no, he got it right. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, yet it is they that bear witness about me. If you believe Moses, he goes on to say, you would believe me because he wrote of me. And it's interesting that Romans, uh, Romans is bookended by statements about the Old Testament. Paul opens up by saying he's set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And then there's a beautiful doxology at the end of Romans where he also highlights that the mystery has now been revealed. The prophetic writings have now been disclosed through the coming of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that I preached to you what was of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was raised according to the Scriptures, and there he's re referring to the Old Testament Scriptures. The same is said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that the scriptures there, the Old Testament scriptures, are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Turn over to the book of Acts and you see sermon after sermon alluding to the Old Testament, right? Acts 13, you see a great recorded sermon or at least an excerpt from Paul's sermon in Antioch, Pisidia, where he starts with Abraham and moves seamlessly to Jesus Christ. He shows up in Thessalonica and he doesn't hand out a bunch of tracts, but instead it says he reasoned in the synagogue from the scriptures proving that Jesus was the Christ. Acts 18, five, he is occupied with the word, Paul is, testifying that Jesus was the Christ. It was said of Apollos that he powerfully refuted the Jews in public showing by the scriptures that Christ was Jesus. Acts 26, verse 22, Paul goes before Agrippa and he says, I'm saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that Christ must suffer and rise and he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. And then at the very end of the book of Acts, what do we find Paul doing? Luke says, from morning to evening he expounded to them, set forth, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets. And we stand in that great tradition of opening up the scriptures and pointing people to Jesus. And that's what Paul is instructing us to do here. The Bible is not some inspiring book of virtues. It's a hymn book. It's about him. <laughs> and it's possible, very possible, to know stories about in the Bible without knowing the story of the Bible. And if we don't put it in the whole Bible context, we end up making a lot of simple moral applications that are often very arbitrary from stories. Or we do really crazy things like say, well, Solomon built a, an opulent temple, we need to do the same thing. Or Ruth is about being nice to your mother-in-law, which, which I am for, by the way, being nice to your mother-in-law. But there's a whole lot more there, right? For Paul, I think preaching Christ meant preaching his person, his work, his ministry within the context of redemptive history. Mention, uh, preaching Christ is not simply running up to mention his name. It's not some kind of wild allegory where we try to make everything in the Old Testament referring to Christ. Like every time we see wood, well that's the cross. Or every time we see the color red, well that's blood. Uh, Noah made an ark out of gopher wood and gophers go into the ground and they come back up and so that's the resurrection. Um, <laughs> no? You must have never heard that one before. Uh, <laughs> nor is it just teaching a lot of moral principles and then all of a sudden we give an invitation and tell people to come to Christ. It means really following Jesus' example in Luke 24, doesn't it? of spound, expounding all of Scripture in light of Jesus' ministry. As we learned about today, studying the little stories in light of the big story, of honoring both the unity of the Bible as well as the diversity of the Bible. Brian Chappell used the analogy that we study the Bible with a magnifying glass looking at our text, but also with a wide-angle lens. It means that we consider how themes develop across the biblical narrative that point us to Jesus. And there's many more things we could say. Now, what does Paul tell us here? What can we learn from his Christ-centered proclamation in Colossae? <clears throat> I want to point out just, uh, we'll look at it in three parts. First of all, the priority of Christ-centered preaching. 
Secondly, the purpose of Christ-centered preaching. And thirdly, you know it's a P, the power for Christ-centered preaching. Before we get there, we see in verse 24 that there is a price to pay for proclaiming the gospel. As Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. He's filling up in his flesh, speaking here of his physical sufferings, attacks, dangers, imprisonments, and he's enduring these sufferings to fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. This, of course, doesn't mean that there's anything lacking in the atonement. Christ's death is sufficient. The whole letter speaks about that, that he is enough. It's been said that Christ's sufferings were for our propitiation. Our sufferings is for propagation, that we don't get the gospel to the nations without afflictions. And the remarkable thing here is that Paul says that he rejoices in these afflictions. And why, why would he say such a thing? Well, you're willing to suffer for the thing that you love. And Paul loves Christ, and he loves the church. And then he speaks of this ministry of proclamation that brought about this suffering. And even today, in various parts of the world, Christ-centered preaching will get you killed. That it will bring persecution. And Paul is experiencing that. So he's not writing from, from, from some theological ivory tower, but on the mission field himself. So first of all, the, the priority of uh, Christ-centered preaching is mentioned in verses 25 to 28. He mentions a stewardship that is received in verse 25, a mystery that is revealed in verses 26 and 7, and then an approach to follow in verse 28, a stewardship received, verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. Paul was given this ministry from God, and he serves the church by communicating God's word, not his opinions, not his pet topics, but to make the word of God fully known. He's a steward. A steward is kind of like a table waiter, not cooking the food, but, but delivering the food as the chef has prepared it. Our job is to deliver God's word as he has given it to us. Uh, Phil Jensen, in, in a book on preaching, uses the analogy of the Mona Lisa. Uh, you know, the Mona Lisa that uh, rests in this bulletproof case in the Louvre today has only been outside of the Louvre uh, on a few occasions. And he, he says, what would it be like if you were responsible for carrying the Mona Lisa? You know, what would you do in that situation? You wouldn't look at this painting and say, well, you know, she's not very pretty. Uh, maybe we should give her some makeup or uh, a weave or something like that. Um, your job is not to edit the painting, it's to deliver the painting. And we have been given something way more precious uh, than a picture. We've been given God's word and our job is to showcase it, to deliver it, to deliver that which we have received. This is the stewardship that we've been given, a holy stewardship like the Apostle Paul to make the word of God fully known. Now notice verse 26 and seven, he tells us what the word of God is about. So the job is to make it known. What's it about? Verse 27, that God has chose to make known how great are the riches of, the, of his glory, which is Christ in you. That the, the idea for Paul to make the word of God known was to make Christ known. That the message of this word is about Christ. He calls it in verse 26, a mystery. And this is not a mystery like you know, a Sherlock Holmes mystery or some kind of uh, mystery that was present in Asia Minor with the mystery cults. Uh, many thought Christianity was a mystery. This is something that has now been revealed in the coming of Jesus Christ. You might call this mystery the storyline of the scriptures. Jesus is the hero of this story. It's about God's unfolding plan to bring about redemption through his Messiah. And he tells us that specifically in verse 27, doesn't he? Uh, that the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And here is one of those themes that actually develops across the biblical narrative, doesn't it? The indwelling presence of Christ. We pick this theme up really in the garden, don't we? God dwelling with our parents. But then in the book of Exodus, you know, what is... How does Exodus work? In, in the first 18 chapters of Exodus, God delivers. And then in chapters 19 to 24, 
God demands. And then at the end of the book, chapters 25 to 40, is all about God dwelling. And I think the climax of the book is in that last part. It's in all of those crazy instructions about the linens and the lampstands and the particular kind of wood and all of those things. He says in 25 verse 18 of Exodus, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. God wants to dwell with his people. And it's like he will do anything to dwell with them. I don't know if you ever had a, a long distance dating relationship. My wife and I did. And uh, we would, you would just make sacrifices to get on the road, even if it was just to see each other for two hours. Because you just wanted to be together. And that's our God. He wants to be with his people. He wants to be so close that he's not content with that tabernacle and that tent. But in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we see this theme then uh, expand and culminate in the book of Revelation as God is dwelling with his people. And we have the great privilege as preachers of preaching to people the hope of glory. That this Christ will dwell in you and you will one day dwell with him. And this is what inspires hope and perseverance. And this is one of the marks of Christ-centered preaching. Brian Chappell says helpfully that Christ-centered preaching always offers hope. So preach this Christ to sinners and sufferers. Take this truth to their struggle, the hope of glory. And as we preach Christ, we, we, know, we need to not only do it in a homiletically responsible way, but we also need to preach Christ from a Christ-centered heart. That is, we're adoring the Christ that we're holding out to people. We want people to say at the end of our sermons, not what a great sermon, but what a great Savior. And they, they see that not only in how we've arranged the sermon, but in how we've conveyed, you know, uh, our, our own adoration of this Christ. What a great Savior we have. Because good preaching is overflow. To say, taste and see that the Lord is good, we need to be tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. I don't know if any of you guys like to cook, but I like to cook once a week at least. Uh, not very often, but, um, but when you get something perfectly like your guacamole, uh, you, you're not content with keeping it to yourself. At least you shouldn't be. You just, so you're going around the house telling people, oh, you got to try this. And that's the joy of sermon prep as we dig in and we see Christ and, and we preach out of the overflow of that and we get to tell people, you got to taste this. I don't know what you've been tasting all week, but you haven't tasted this. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this is what keeps sermon prep from being mechanical and ministry from being dry because we have to guard against what I call being the sermonator, <laughs> you know, <laughs> where you can just mechanically churn out sermons. Some of us are, you know, you, some of you are pros at this. We give you a text and you've got an outline in 30 minutes. But are we preaching from our hearts to people's hearts? Now, some people object when you talk about Christ-centered preaching a few things. Well, won't this get old? Won't this get boring? Well, maybe if you're boring. Uh, <laughs> But we're not advocating that, okay? Uh, no, I don't think it gets boring because hearing my wife tell me that she loves me never gets old. And you have the great joy of walking the bride down the aisle every week to their groom. That should never get old. Shouldn't get old when you consider the rich diversity of Scripture and the various aspects of Christ's person and work that we may bring out in different sermons. You know, Paul says in, in Ephesians 3 that we preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's bottomless. As long as we are preaching Christ, we never run out of material. For all of eternity, we'll be growing in the knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ. Well, there's an approach to follow in verse 28. The subject is there in verse uh, 28, Him we proclaim... We point people to him, not to us. You know the old rapper Tupac? He used to have a song, All Eyes on Me. That's the opposite of Christ-centered preaching. We're saying all eyes on him. 
Here's a great picture of a Luther preaching, uh, painted by Lucas Cronach, who was one of the painters during the Protestant Reformation. If you go to Wittenberg today, you can see a number of uh, Cronach's paintings. And one of them I have in my office, uh, where, where it's a group of people sitting in the congregation. Luther's preaching, he's got one finger on the text, and a finger pointing to the crucified Christ. And all the eyes of the congregation are on Christ, not their world-famous preacher. Him we proclaim. And notice, Paul says, we proclaim. He's not the only one that gets to proclaim Christ. <laughs> you get to proclaim Christ. I get to proclaim Christ. God buries his messengers, but the message continues. We don't just have one storyteller. We have one story to tell. Him we proclaim. That's the great tradition we stand in. And then he gives us the ways in which we proclaim Christ. Notice, we proclaim, that is, we herald. So we do the work of evangelism in announcing the gospel to people. We also warn people. So we do the work not only of evangelism, but of warning like a prophet. It's a very important part, isn't it? This is the idea of admonishing people who are drifting away, who are, who are falling away. So faithful Christ-centered teachers and preachers cannot be afraid to warn. This is the case in Colossae. Paul is, is warning them about the danger of crazy theology. He says to the Ephesians, uh, therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night and day to admonish you, to warn you. He warned about false doctrine. He warned about the judgment to come. So there's an element of Christ-centered preaching that's always going to include an element of warning in addition to evangelism. And then he says we also teach everyone. So we teach like a theologian. You, you see the ways in which we, we do the, the work of Christ-centered preaching. We herald, we announce the news, we warn, and then we come behind the announcement and the warnings and we explain. We do the work of, of teaching. All of this shows us, by the way, doesn't it, that, that this requires a lot of study. A lot of hard work. But the call to preach is a call to study. The call to teach is a call to study. And then he says we, we also do the work of applying wisdom. We do this with all wisdom. So we work like an evangelist, we work like a prophet, we work like a teacher, <clears throat> and we work like a sage. We, we show people how the message of the gospel relates to everyday life. And for a quick example of that, you just turn over to Colossians 3, and, and you see some ways in which Paul addresses real-life issues, but he ties it all back to Christ. That we forgive, but not only do we forgive, we, we forgive as those who have been forgiven. And he, he mentions issues uh, uh, also in, in society re related to race and, and um, uh, sexual purity and so on, but it's always tied to our union with Christ, and that's the work of applying the gospel like a sage. So we have this sort of comprehensive ministry of the word that includes a lot of different dynamics, but then notice also we have a comprehensive audience. Who is it that needs Christ-centered preaching and teaching? You notice the repetition, warning everyone, teaching everyone, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Who needs Christ-centered exposition? Everyone. You know, Paul may be making a little dig here at the Colossians and the Colossian heresy because some believe there was sort of an elite crowd, the insiders, who were kind of this ultra-spiritual group, those who were in the know on spiritual things. But so Paul says Christ and growth in Christ is available to everyone. It's not just for a little clique. It's not for the elite. It's for every uh, John and Sally that's in our church that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So what do people need in Nigeria? They need Christ. What, would, what do people need in New York? They need Christ. I remember several years ago, I was in Nigeria, and uh, we were making a trip to a leper colony, and uh, I just thought we were going to visit and try to encourage those, those poor people in this, uh, this leper colony, totally isolated from the rest of the town. And about uh, midway through our visit, the, the chaplain who we went with, who was a, a medical chaplain, he, said, he gathered everybody up and he says, now Pastor Tony will preach. I didn't know I was preaching, you know. I, I didn't have a Bible. Well, what would you do there? It's a good test question. In the middle of a leper colony, with no Bible, everybody looking at you, what do you preach on? 
You, you already answered it, right? Yeah, yeah. You're not doing like five tips on how to raise kids or uh, <laughs> some kind of uh, little motivational speech. What I did, to the best of my ability, and wasn't very good, but I tried to quote Romans 8, beginning verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present world not worth comparing next to the glory that will be revealed to us. And I began to talk to these people about how you're really no different from us, that we're dying also. And uh, we're here for a short time, and our hope is not in this life. It's in the glory that is to come. And I have a picture of this lady who had no fingers as I was preaching, holding her hands up in worship. That's what the most desperate people in the world, most hurting people in the world need is the message of Jesus Christ. And it's also what the most popular, wealthy, got it all together person in this world needs. This is a comprehensive audience. Everywhere we go, people need this message. So that's the priority of Christ-centered preaching. Now, briefly, let me hit the second two. The purpose of Christ-centered preaching, and I don't have to spend much time here uh, because my brother from Australia already mentioned this uh, today. I would love to have either accent of the other two preachers. Uh, maybe in the new creation. Uh, okay? I'll, have, I'll have hair and a new accent. Um, but this purpose is to present everyone mature or complete or perfect in Christ. So notice that kind of this twofold purpose here. There's a sanctifying purpose and an eternal purpose. Sanctifying purpose in that we're trying to mature people in Christ. Obviously we preach Christ for people who are not Christians yet. Paul's already mentioned that in the beginning of the letter as he mentioned the hard work of Epaphras who preached the gospel and, and people came to faith. But christ Center preaching is not just for an evangelistic purpose, it's also for maturing people in Christ. And there are just a few ways I would mention how this sanctifies believers. It sanctifies, it has a sanctifying impact because maturity doesn't mean that we go beyond Jesus to something else. That was the problem in Colossae. That's why Paul says, I think in the thesis statement of Colossians 2, that just as you receive Christ, so walk in Him. We continue to walk in Him. And Paul, who is quite mature, says, here's what I want. I want to know Christ more in Philippians 3. It also has a sanctifying impact because change happens through our affections. As we begin to behold the wonder of Jesus, we begin to become more like him. Paul mentions this in 2 Corinthians 3.18. To see people's behavior change, we need affections to change. When you love Jesus deeply, it changes your behavior dramatically. So we want to hold up the beauty of Jesus. We only got about, at best, probably 50 weeks of people. Some of them only 30 minutes a week. What are we going to give them? It also has a sanctifying impact because sanctification involves persevering through trials. And people need a lofty vision of Christ to persevere. And that's what you see happening in the book of Hebrews, right? Glorious picture of Christ, exhortation to persevere. Glorious picture of Christ, exhortation to persevere. Good Christ-centered preaching takes truth to struggle. It applies Christ to the, the trials that our folks are having. So there is a, a sanctifying purpose to Christ-centered preaching. And then I say there's an eternal purpose not just a temporal purpose. And I get that from this word, to present. This idea of presenting them has the idea of standing before God. So what we're doing in teaching and preaching and in ministry is fitting people for eternity. We preach with eternity in mind. In other words, we preach in order to get people ready to die. Every week. So how might we get them ready to die? Well, redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. We keep it on their minds week after week after week after week. Purpose of Christ-centered preaching. And finally, the power for Christ-centered preaching. We marvel at Paul's work ethic, don't we? Verse 29, and we know the rest of his stories elsewhere in the Bible when he says, for this I toil struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Here's the encouraging part of this text. The wider use of this word toil means a beating. Paul's weariness results from 
It, it feels like he's been repeatedly struck by someone. I toil. Maybe you feel like that at this, uh, before you came to this conference. You feel like you've taken a beating in ministry. And then his work ethic is further described with the imagery of an athletic contest when he uses the word translated here as struggling. He's exhausted. And the work of ministry is exhausting if we're doing it well and, and you know, being hard at it, right? Luther reportedly fell into bed some nights because he was so tired. Wesley exhausts me just reading his biography. <laughs> Moody's bedtime prayer was often, Lord, I'm tired, amen. <laughs> now, why is it that preaching is so exhausting? I don't know if you've ever thought about that very much. Preaching fatigue is inevitable. The study is often thankless, often lonely, and always exhausting. And the act of preaching the sermon is also exhausting. I saw a good picture of a Monday morning pastor the first time I went to San Francisco in those sea lions that just sort of roll around and grunt. I was like, that's a pastor right there on a Monday. Another reason they're, they're, it's exhausting is because our, the results are often invisible. And that's a weird thing we do. I mean, you mow the grass, it feels good, doesn't it? Like, look what I did. There's progress. My wife asked me, I go preach somewhere, how did it go? I don't know. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> I mean, sometimes we think we see some stuff, but sometimes we're deceived also, right? And we just, we just plant, pray for God to send rain, know that he gives the growth. Another reason it's exhausting is it's controversial. Like we're dealing in controversial stuff. We're not dealing in stuff that's just irrelevant on the grand scheme of things. And it's exhausting because people are critical. As someone said it well, preaching is like dying naked a little at a time. And then knowing you've got to do it all over again next week. <laughs> People see flaws in us. We're fully exposed. And it's exhausting because it's spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. You know, the parable of the soils, Jesus says, sometimes the seed is sown and Satan immediately takes it up. He is at work in preaching. There's warfare going on. But notice the hope here. That's Paul's work ethic. But notice his source of energy. He says, though the work is laborious, Christ's energy is limitless. I labor with all his energy that he powerfully works within us. Here is our source of strength tonight, Christ in us. Amen. Our strength tonight is not in how long we've been a Christian or how much we know about the Bible or how long we've been in ministry. It's in our union with Jesus Christ. And it's supercharged by our communion with Jesus Christ. I labor, I toil, I work, not in and of my own energy and strength, but with his energy that he powerfully works within me. Spurgeon has been quoted many times, but I'll quote him one more relating to this text. This guy works so much. One time he said, no one knows the toil and care I have to bear. I have to look after the orphanage, have charge of a church with 4,000 members. Sometimes there are marriages and burials to be undertaken. There is the weekly sermon to be revised, the sword and the trial to be edited, and besides all that, a weekly average of 500 letters to be answered. This, however, is only half my duty, for there are innumerable esta uh, churches established by my friends, uh, the affairs with which I am closely connected, to say nothing of the cases of difficulty which are constantly being referred to me. At his 50th birthday, a list of 66 organizations were read that he founded and conducted. One man said, this list of associations instituted by his genius and superintended by his care were more than enough to occupy the minds and hearts of 50 ordinary men. He typically read six substantial books a week and could remember what he read and where to find it. He produced more than 140 books of his own. He often worked 18 hours a day, which I don't recommend. The missionary David Livingston once asked him, who was quite a worker himself, how do you manage to do two men's work in a single day? To which he replied, 
you have forgotten. There are two of us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, Christ is not just the grand subject of our preaching. He's also the source of energy. William Perkins, one of the early writers on preaching, said, preach one Christ by Christ to the praise of Christ. To God alone be the glory. What a privilege it is to know this Christ. And a double privilege to preach this Christ. Preach him until you see him. Peter David's in his commentary on 2 Peter talking about the scriptures says regarding the return of Christ, then the light of Christ will be in our hearts and we will no longer need the scriptures. One treasures a love letter while the beloved is absent, but once he or she is present, the letter is laid aside in exchange for personal contact. The Bible is this holy love letter about our Savior, and one day we will see him. We will see the one that we've preached about. And so let's prioritize Christ in our exposition that people may grow into maturity and be ready to die and let us do all of this with the energy that Christ supplies, preaching him until we see him. And when we do, when we see him, we will not regret having done so. Thanks be to God for his word. Father, we bow our heads tonight and we pray for grace. We pray for strength that you would give us a marathon ministry that as long as our heart beats, we would exalt Christ from his word that people would come to know Christ, they would grow in likeness to Christ, and they would be ready to see their Christ. And so I pray for my brothers here tonight, in whatever teaching capacity they, they're in, whether it be Sunday morning preaching or some other aspect of disciple making, I pray that you would, you would give us millions of Christ-centered expositors deployed all across this earth, that we could saturate the nations with sound doctrine and that many people would come to know and love our, our, our Christ. And we pray this tonight in his good name. Everyone said, amen. Brothers, let's stand and sing together again. the grave.
please be seated. Tony, thank you. It says it's on. There we go. It's usually my fault. Uh, Tony, thank you. It's a sweet thing when brothers from afar become friends up close, so we really appreciate it. Uh, a couple things for you as we uh, sort of bring our night to a close. Uh, just a few announcements. One, uh, we have a school that meets in the children's wing, and they're back in session tomorrow. So those doors will be locked, uh, just so you know, and you don't try to come in that way. Secondly, there is a shuttle service that will take uh, people from here to Cleveland Hopkins, uh, and you can sign up for that or find out when it leaves at the info desk. And we ask that you help us by doing that tonight so we can get a good count. And then lastly, there is another mission breakfast uh, tomorrow morning, same room up above the commons, uh, this time with one of our uh, partnerships with Streams of Living Water, which seeks to plant churches and do gospel work in northern Africa. So we'd invite you to that uh, and encourage you to come. Uh, lastly, uh, it is 7.57. We're back here uh, at 8.30 uh, for a Q&A time with Alistair. So we'll see you then. Thank you. <laughs>